And hello, thank you for joining us tonight. And we are really pleased to have Elisa Wood uh, this evening as our Empower Hour speaker. I'm Mary Pettigrew. I'm part of the Empower Our Future Communications team. And on their behalf, I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's uh, Empower Hour. But let me go ahead and start uh, the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect as non-Native people that the land on which we stand, live, and learn is the tr traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. Uh, we honor elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also recognize that our government, academic, and cultural institutions, and our nation itself were founded upon and continue to exact, sorry, excuse me, to enact exclusions and erasures of Indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, oppression, and inequities and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, create, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. Let us seek to understand what it means to be in right relationship today with the traditional stewards of this land and with this land itself and with all the creatures that inhabit it. I am pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Alisa Wood, an award-winning writer and editor who specializes in the energy industry. She's chief editor and co-founder of Microgrid Knowledge and serves as co-host of the publication's popular conference series. And I think you have one coming up in May, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Alisa also co-founded realenergywriters.com, where she continues to lead a team of energy writers who produce content for energy companies and advocacy organizations. Her team specializes in ghost written articles and blogs, white papers, reports, scripts, and website copy. She has been writing about energy for more than three decades and is published widely. Her work can be found in prominent energy business journals, as well as mainstream publications, including NPR, The Wall Street Journal, and other notable media outlets. Elisa lives in rural Virginia and is a big fan of horses and yoga, as well as microgrids, apparently. <laughs> uh, thank you, Elisa, for being here uh, again. And to start, we've got a video that we are going to share. There we go. The 1950s usual, was a decade of breakthroughs for America, the first computer modem, the first transistor radio, and most of the transmission towers we rely on today for electric power were built in the 1950s. The life expectancy for this national network of towers was approximately 50 years. Our grandparents' grid system is way past its prime. It's unreliable dirty and expensive, and it can't handle the demands of the 21st century. It can't handle threats of cyber warfare. It can't handle extreme weather events. It can't ensure that critical facilities like hospitals stay functioning when the lights go out. One transmission failure can ripple through many communities. Our traditional grid system also fails to handle the increasing demand from new technology. Now is the time to reimagine our electric systems. One way to power into the future is with microgrids. Across the U.S., small-scale power networks called microgrids are emerging as the smart solution to our failing national grid system. By integrating multiple renewable power sources like solar, wind, and battery storage, microgrids can maximize efficiency and ensure uninterrupted power. What's more, these revolutionary systems can address climate change and help us transition from fossil fuels to clean energy without being disruptive. We need microgrids today because our grid is brittle and it needs to be brought into the 21st century where we're facing real climate risks, 
real disruptions. We have a pathway to clean energy and to distributed energy that microgrids enable. How does a microgrid differ from the central grid? Our current central electric grid is the interconnected wires and poles and power plants that deliver electricity to homes and businesses across the country. It is completely interdependent. If a transmission line in one community fails, other communities can suffer. A microgrid using locally sourced renewable energy serves a small geographic area, like a campus or a neighborhood or a city. It can be either completely independent or work in sync with the current central electric grid. Eventually, a statewide and nationwide series of microgrids can replace our central, unreliable, and inefficient grid system. Because they rely on locally produced renewable energy, microgrids can run independently, sometimes called islanding, in the event of wildfires, floods, or hurricanes, or any other major disruption. A microgrid is basically a mini version of the larger grid, except that it's smarter, it's cleaner, it's more efficient and it's tailored to meet the local community's needs using their local resources. The thing about microgrids is that because they're deployed at the local level, they also provide high paying, good quality jobs in the communities that need them. According to a 2021 economic impact report by Guidehouse, microgrids powered by renewable energy will generate nearly 500,000 new jobs. 72 billion in GDP growth, and 146 billion in business sales by 2030. Microgrids also address one of the biggest inefficiencies of the centralized system, which is moving power from one place to another. With the central electric grid, significant power is lost when it has to travel miles and miles across transmission lines. Microgrids are more efficient because energy is created very close to where it is used, which, in addition to efficiency, also means savings to consumers. By some estimates, as much as 15% of the power generated by power plants is lost by the time that it reaches the consumer. Society pays the price for that in the form of higher energy costs and environmental harm. Where do microgrids exist today? The United States Department of Defense is the largest energy consumer in the nation and the largest petroleum consumer in the world. So it's not surprising with its mission to uphold national security that the military was an early and strong champion of microgrids, including a microgrid that is 100% clean energy in Hawaii. You can find microgrids in other critical areas where a power failure could spell catastrophe. There's another important human equity concern, which is that the impacts of the grid have not been distributed fairly. The old grid's power generating plants are located in some of the country's most vulnerable communities. During extreme weather, the health and safety burden falls disproportionately on the communities who are the first to have their power cut and the last to come back online. Renewable microgrids can help correct this disparity and ensure that all communities have access to reliable, affordable, pollution-free energy. Are people ready for microgrid technology? It turns out Democrats and Republicans can agree on one thing microgrids, at least once they understand them. A recent bipartisan survey of voters found that once microgrids are explained, support for this technology grows. Nearly eight in 10 Americans support the use of microgrids once they learn what they are and how they can solve the challenges we face. The next generation of political leaders from both sides of the aisle agree and are ready to make microgrids happen. We all want to build a better future. Reforming energy policy is not a political issue. It is a human health issue. It is an environmental issue. It's a national security issue. It's an economic issue. And so it is no surprise that microgrid technology enjoys the support of Americans across the political spectrum. We have the technology at hand to solve many problems at once with the creation of a modern electric grid using today's proven technologies. Learn more about how microgrids can benefit your community and how you can play a role in giving the breakthrough technology of our time 
its rightful place in history. Go to thinkmicrogrid.org. Great video. So it's all you, Elisa, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, I appreciate it. And I appreciate being here today and the work that you're doing with Empower Hour. Such a great forum, so much good information is coming through here. I just wish every community had something like this. Boulder's really lucky. <laughs> um, so um, I'm here today to talk to you about microgrids, as you know. That film was actually created by a group called the Civil Society Institute. Very interesting group. They, about every five years ago, they choose a theme to put their efforts into, and they chose microgrids about five years ago. They look for something that has environmental impact and that they think they can bring sort of the, the, the quarreling sides of our society together on. And they decided that microgrids were, were, were that, that um, effort. So um, they're, they are trying to get that video um, uh, displayed far and wide. So please feel free to share that link and, and you know, put it up everywhere you want to because that will make them very, very happy. They're trying to get that message out. So um, I am coming from, to you from Virginia and we are in the middle of pollen season. So I'm really hoping my voice holds out. <laughs> I'm gonna do the best I can um, tonight. Um, we also have a little bit of a, a technical problem with my slides, but um, I think that somebody from the team is going to put them up for me. Can we get started with the slides? Yay, you did it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so you all know who I am, who I am, and I'm here today to talk about microgrids as an alternative to wires or as non-wires alternative, which is the term that's often used for microgrids. Um, this is, a, I, was, I was so excited when I was invited to talk about this because it really is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, microgrids are used for a lot of reasons. We'll talk a little bit about that. But as an alternative to transmission seems so important right now because, you know, we're all hearing um, the clamoring for <coughs> bigger energy, um, you know, more transmission, more power plants. You know, we're hearing that the renewable future, future relies on these massive transmission lines. Um, I don't think that's true. And let's be realistic that all oh, this tr transmission is not going to be built. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So here's just an overview of the issue of what we'll be talking about. So as I said, there's a huge push on to build transmission. The numbers are massive that are involved, 6.5 billion per year is what NREL thinks we're gonna need in order to get to that place of 80% renewables on the grid. Um, there's a quote here from Bill Gates. He, he, he says that over a thousand gigawatts worth of potential clean projects are waiting for approval about the size of the entire US grid. And the primary reason is, bottleneck, uh, is the bottleneck in transmission. So this is why we're, we're hearing this call for so much transmission, but, um, the world doesn't seem to want a lot more transmission. Transmission lines are being delayed. Um, God, I know of one project that's been 10 years in the works. Um, interconnection, interconnection delays are massive. You, you, many of you probably saw that uh, Ryan Weiser from the um, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory has, been, has put out a report recently. And um, he said that the total capacity of all power plant projects awaiting interconnection now exceeds the capacity of the entire US power fleet. More than 95% of that queued capacity is zero carbon energy. So it's renewable energy. So and even more is gonna be coming because now we have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is pouring a lot of money into renewables. And this is all great. We're all very happy about that, but it's clear there's something wrong with the system. We, we can't possibly build the amount of transmission that we're told we need to get to that zero carbon point we need to get to. So what do we do? Well, there is another alternative and that's what we're talking about today. Not only does it avoid this problem of, of many of the problems that transmission come along with. I mean, um, there's, there's a lot of opposition to transmission because often it goes through scenic or historic or 
or pristine or environmentally sensitive areas. So that's why one of the reasons these projects get delayed for so long. So let's get into talking a bit more about the alternative. So could you put up the next slide? So microgrids, so you, you learned in the, what a microgrid is. I always start with what a microgrid is in every presentation because I'm always surprised at how many people don't know. Um, I'll, I'll be at an energy conference speaking and I'll think, well, here's a bunch of engineers and energy people and they all know what it is. And I'll ask how many people, you know, how many people feel like if they had that really tough teacher in 10th grade um, who asked them to write what a microgrid is on a piece of paper, could they do it? It's amazing how many people, you know, say, no, I couldn't do it. Amazing to me, I guess, because I, I, I'm in the microgrid sphere, but um, really to the world, microgrids are a pretty, pretty new concept. And we've really found that in the polling to be true too. So just to real quickly uh, go over it one more time, so, um, the real key to a microgrid is that it, it has multiple forms of generation. Uh, very commonly these days, it's solar and storage. And what sets it apart from a typical solar and storage system is that it can island from the grid, meaning that when there's a power outage, it can sense um, a disturbance on the grid, as I like to say, um, and it will it will separate itself from the grid so that the on-site generation isn't disturbed, there's not a, a rolling cascade into, into that system. And it will provide power on site to the facility, whether it's a campus or um, a residential community or a military base or whatever it is um, that has the microgrid. Um, so that, that's the key difference between a microgrid and what would be typically be a, a solar and storage system. And of course, microgrids don't have to, the, microgrids can use any kind of generation. There are all kinds of microgrids out there. There are a lot of natural gas fired microgrids. Um, there are a lot of microgrids that have solar storage and then a diesel generator as the backup to the backup. Um, there are, uh, we're seeing, now we're starting to see river current microgrids, um, hydrogen microgrids. So any form of generation can be used. Solar and storage is, is, is very common. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to give you a sense of how many microgrids there are in the United States. And this does not give you a sense. <laughs> this, this is a map of the, um, from the Department of Energy. And um, they are trying to track microgrids, but it's, it's tough to do because there's no there's no central depository where microgrids register. Uh, and there are a lot of businesses that have microgrids and they never tell anybody that they have a microgrid. They sort of have no reason to. Um, so th this is this is what the DOE can identify. Mostly I'm showing you this map because um, it's interesting to see where the clusters are of microgrids. So you'll see it's, it's mostly the East Coast, it's Texas, and it's the West Coast. Um, somebody once said to me, if you want to know where microgrids will be developed, follow the carnage. And so you can kind of see that. This is the Hurricane Alley. There's actually a lot more in Florida than show here. They're not picking up those on the map. It's a, uh, I saw another map that was put out by a company, a private company, um, during last year's hurricane season, and it was just a lot of them in Florida. Um, in Texas, of course, and we've all heard about what's going on with the Texas grid. And then California um, with this wildfires and, and other issues that are going on with its grid. So that's where you'll tend to find the microgrids. Um, I think I've got some numbers here. I was going to give you. Uh, no, I guess I don't have them, but it's it's in the it's, it's in last number I saw for microgrids was 4,000 in the US. Um, I do know that Wood McKenzie is doing um, now doing a, an evaluation, which they should have out soon. Soon, which will provide more detail on, on how many are actually there now. It's growing very quickly. Um, and California is, is the number one state in terms of growth, uh, largely because of the wildfires and, well, more than one reason, for, because of the wildfires, because of the PSPS events in, in, in California, also because there's a lot of sustainability goals in California and um, high prices. You also find microgrids where there are a lot of high grid electricity prices. People are looking to go off grid to get down, to, to reduce their energy cost. Okay, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> so these are the main benefits of microgrids. Primary reason people decide to develop a microgrid is, is for reliability. <coughs> um, cost management is becoming a very, is, is quickly becoming a, a, a primary reason. 
Sustainability and then grid stability is the fourth reason. And we're seeing more and more utilities that are building microgrids. And they're doing this in order to, um, to um, balance the grid. So if there's, um, you know, if the wind stops blowing, you know how that goes up. The intermittency of renewable energy, if, if that is kicking into place, a microgrid <coughs> can quickly inject power and uh, take care of the problem. Let's go to the next slide. So this is mentioned in the video. Um, <laughs> the polling has shown that um, there is a lot of um, good feeling about microgrids out there it's, it's across both parties, but for different reasons. Um, they found that Democrats were favoring microgrids because of climate, while Republicans favored them uh, more for security, energy security reasons. So we refer to it as the peanut butter and jelly technology because you can take both sides and put them together into something great and you have a microgrid. Let's do the next slide. <clears throat> so we did a survey uh, last year of utilities uh, to see what they're thinking about microgrids. This, um, we had done another survey about five years ago and we saw a lot of change, a lot more interest uh, by utilities. Um, <coughs> excuse me, these allergies are really tough today. Um, so um, I, I say that utilities have a love-hate-meh relationship with microgrid technology. Some of them are actually, you know, we're going to talk about some microgrids later that utilities are actually doing. They see the value, they're investing in them. Um, other utilities are completely opposed to microgrids. They see them as competition. They try to block them. And then there's... Uh, an increasingly small percentage of meh, we just don't think about them. And in fact, this survey showed only 2% of utilities say they have no role to play with microgrids, which really surprised me. And 82% of investor in utilities have deployed a microgrid or are working on one. This was a huge leap from five years ago. So uh, we asked them why they're, what are their obstacles? Why aren't they all doing microgrids? And um, you'll see here that cost of capital was number one or lack of capital, costs and lack of capital. That's a really important point when you start talking about transmission or, or microgrids as non-wires alternatives, because you know, why, aren't, why aren't more utilities doing microgrids instead of building transmission? I think it's, it's a really simple answer. It's, it's monetary. I mean, they, they do get a return on transmission. They do not get a return on microgrids, or it's not a guaranteed return, put it that way. So that's a big issue, and it's one of many issues that um, you know, need, regulators and policymakers really need to take a hard look at in the United States if we're going to have more, more microgrids. Okay, next slide. And this one just basically the same, the same uh, survey kind of looks at um, what some of the policy concerns. Again, you see the first one is economic benefits of, look, this is actually a little, it's not actually concerns. This is, um, what policies will most influence the market? But again, it's economic is, is, is the most important one. Um, so dispatchable microgrids, this is this is kind of a, a, a big trend in microgrids now. I, I'd said before that resiliency was the primary reason people put in microgrids, but the cost is becoming, um, getting energy costs down is becoming um, increasingly important too. And one of the ways that's done is that microgrids can participate in markets um, and they can participate in demand response. Um, they can provide insular services. So they are a way not, not just to provide um, backup power to the local fire station or water treatment plant, but also a way to help bolster the grid when the grid is in trouble. And so we're seeing utilities increasingly interested in microgrids for that purpose. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And then, um, so we have basically two, two groups of stakeholders that are working on microgrids and they don't always see eye to eye. There are the utilities and then there are the private developers, the, the non-utility stakeholders. And um, there are some pretty big issues out there um, in terms of developing private microgrids. And one of them you'll see is the second point here, over the fence rule. Um, that's what it's called in California. It's called other things in other states. But basically, the basic problem or concept is that um, you cannot build a microgrid to serve 
more, more than one building if the property that those buildings are on have separate owners. So you, basically you cannot cross a utility right of way or cross a road um, with power. Um, it, 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 it's, um, it defies utility franchise rules. So this really makes it difficult for microgrids. You, you, we see a lot of um, microgrids on properties like a, a college campus, for example, all owned by one owner. So you can move the power around from building to building, that's fine. But then you have a community that wants a microgrid or a neighborhood that wants a microgrid and you run into problems where the utility won't allow that to happen. California is trying to get around that somewhat by um, building community, it's, it's putting $200 million into um, utility community microgrids. So the utilities are um, on board, you know, they're, they're basically in charge of that project. So um, these communities can, can have microgrids. Um, but, you know, there are, there are other, other, other forces, factors, you know, private companies who say, hey, you know, we could build these faster than the utilities can let us do it, especially in a place like California where it's really, really desperately needed. Um, another big one with, with uh, microgrids is energy equity. It's becoming an increasingly port, important reason why microgrids are being built. Um, there's a sense that, you know, we talked about in, in the video, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, that, that um, vulnerable communities have been sort of left out, or not even left out, sometimes they've gotten the coal plants, right, in their communities. Uh, but microgrids are a way to bring clean energy quickly to these communities and give them a stake in their local energy. It's not, the money is staying within the community. So big reason in terms of energy equity and social justice to um, build more microgrids. And then the third, which I um, indicated earlier was, is that um, we're able to integrate more renewables into the grid if we have more microgrids. Cause again, microgrids can act as a balance when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining on the grid. Okay, next slide. Um, just, I want to just run by some, some major sort of policy changes that are occurring that are influencing the microgrid market. The first one, of course, is, is the Inflation Reduction Act that um, Biden signed in 2022. Um, one of the big and wonderful things about this act for microgrids is that for the first time, microgrids have a tax incentive. It's a 30% tax incentive on the microgrid controller, sort of the, the brain of the microgrid. Um, this, is, this is huge for microgrids. Um, you know, solar and, and, and storage and wind, have, they have um, incentives. And so it was good to see microgrids um, added to that. So, and the really interesting thing for, for microgrids are that because microgrids are, um, a combination of, of these different technologies, they, they get sort of, a, uh, they get uh, several tax incentives. So they can get the incentive on the microcontroller. Um, they can also get um, an incentive on their energy storage. They can get an incentive on their solar. All these incentives together are expected to cut microgrid costs by 10 to 50%. So the microgrid industry is kind of braced for, a little, it's already very active and it's braced now for a lot more. Um, another another big bill um, is was in California. It was passed actually in 2018, um, and the uh, the the um, CPUC, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, shortly after that started um, a series of proceedings, just basically try to figure out how to commercialize microgrids, how to how to make microgrids. Um, just how to how to get more microgrids into California is basically the gist of it. And there's been a series of proceedings. Um, at California, in terms of regu regulation of microgrids, although a lot of people don't agree with everything they're doing, it certainly is a lot further ahead than any other state at this point in terms of looking at some of the really hard issues. So that's why I wanted to bring up Colorado too. Okay, next slide. Um, this is a little more detail on, on what California's done so far. Um, They've uh, made interconnection a little bit easier, which is a huge, huge issue for microgrids and pretty much everybody, anybody who's building anything new these days. Um, they've adopted some tariff changes to, to make it more equitable, more easier to afford. Um, did some, they've done some modification of net, net metering. 
And they're also giving a lot more attention to local and tribal governments to ensure that they get in on some of the grant money. Okay, next slide. Oh, we can skip this one actually. I think I meant to pull that out. Yeah, I meant to pull these out, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm realizing that my Colorado slide didn't make it in here. So um, Colorado has done some, some interesting work. You can skip this slide too. I actually, I meant to give you my slides with Colorado and I have my slides with California here, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so California, I'm, excuse me, Colorado last year passed a microgrid map um, uh, piece of legislation that the governor signed. And um, it's interesting because it not only, um, it not only, it, first of all, it's gonna it, it look, they're gonna look at where in Colorado um, microgrids would be best placed. And um, they're also looking at some of the other big issues around um, microgrids like the over the fence rule that I talked about and tariffs and equity. So um, I'm, I'm really curious to see how, um, how this state does in terms of that map I showed you earlier of the DOE um, mapping of microgrids. I suspect we're gonna start seeing more and more microgrids in Colorado. So I'd be interested to hear what you have to say to the audience about that. You're closer to what's happening on the ground there. So you may be able to give me some really good information too. Um, so there are actually quite a few microgrids that have been built um, as non-wires alternatives. Most of these tend to be microgrids that are in rural outposts where it's difficult to build transmission. Um, two that come to mind were built by Duke Energy in uh, North Carolina. And one of them is Mount Sterling and the name of the other one has left me at the moment, but um, these were projects where they could have built like 10 mile transmission lines or they had 10 mile transmission lines, which weren't very um, reliable. So instead they built microgrids. One of them serves a, a full community and one of them serves a radio tower. And what was very interesting about these projects is that usually energy projects get some kind of opposition. And uh, one of the projects, Mount Sterling, I think we, we call it the no controversy microgrid because it just sailed through the regulatory process. I mean, people just love the idea of having a microgrid rather than having a transmission line go through their, um, go through their scenic you know, mountainscapes. So another um, one like that is in the Sierra Nevadas, um, and that one serves a hydroelectric facility. And it was built in 29 days. And that's another interesting point about microgrids is we have a lot to do in terms of climate pretty quickly. And if we're gonna wait forever to get these transmission lines built to bring in the renewable energy, we're not gonna get there. Microgrids can be built quickly. They're generally built without opposition. And they can get us there where we need to go much more quickly than, than the big stuff, as I say. Um, another thing we're seeing a lot of now in terms of um, sort of these, these non-wireless alternative microgrids is people are looking at how microgrids are gonna serve the uh, EV market. And so you may find a gas station in some remote area but you don't have a transmission line going out to that area that can actually serve a lot of um, EV charging or you know, fleets. So um, more and more microgrids are now being designed to fit in with that, um, that to solve that problem, basically. They're also being designed um, in inner cities or in, inside cities where there's just no room to build more um, uh, transmission and distribution, uh, or even, you know, maybe in substations. Um, and uh, so a microgrid is, is a more compact way to go. So um, that is pretty much what I wanted to run by you. I'm really curious what your questions are. I'd lo love to answer some of them. So hi, uh, this is a first question from Claudia Engelhoff. 
it would seem that identifying and obtaining permission for solar energy arrays in a metropolitan area would be very time consuming and expensive. So how would the time delays and expense of building a microgrid be handled for a medium sized metro area? Yeah, I mean, it can take a while to build a microgrid. A lot of it, permitting can slow it down. Interconnection is probably the primary reason they tend to get slowed down <laughs> from developers. Um, so um, yeah, it's really hard to answer that question because it depends on the metro area, it depends on the permitting in the metro area. I think, but I think that the real key is to educate the regulators as much as you can about microgrids. That's what we find a lot is like it's not, it's not that they're against microgrids. It's not that they want to delay microgrid projects. It's they simply do not know what they are. So I would say, if you're going to do that, really, really spend some time finding who the finding out who the key stakeholders are, and then educating them about microgrids and what the benefits can be not just to those who are going to um, be served by the microgrid, but also to the larger grid in the area. That's very important. And that's become an issue in some regulatory proceedings um, where um, a, a microgrid is proposed, say by a utility, and the utility wants to um, uh, rate base the, the microgrid. But the regulators are saying, wait, we can't do that because this is just going to serve this hospital or this university or factory over here. Um, so it doesn't serve everybody. But they're missing the point that when you have a microgrid there, it can serve, A, it can serve the larger community by being um, a, a place where they can go and you know, plug in and get hot food and you know, um, a, a sanctuary when there's a, when there's a power outage. Um, but also, besides that, it, it can it can serve the larger grid by providing balancing ancillary services, doing responses, different things I talked about, which help bring down costs and increase reliability for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. The next one's from Carl Hansel. There's no reason a microgrid can't be a net supplier of power to its neighbors, right? Such that in addition to supplying power to the immediate customers of the microgrid itself, it could also supply power uh, supply above and beyond. Yeah, so not necessarily, um, but there's a lot of work being done in that regard now. Um, so that's an it depends answer on that one. In Florida, um, there is a neighborhood microgrid that was built in conjunction with the local utility, Tampa Electric. So they're spared that whole over the grid, oh, excuse me, um, over the fence issue because the utility is on board, the utility is a partner in the microgrid. So yes, neighbors can share. Um, there's also, uh, there was an issue in, in California uh, recently, a, a negative decision that came down. Um, a group, Sonova, you probably refer to that solar company, wanted to build what they were, they were calling micro utilities. And basically they were neighborhoods of 2000 or less people residences, re residences, homes, and they um, would be, they would have their own microgrid, would not be connected to the larger grid. And they would be, they would be power sharing within that community, within the microgrid. Um, it went before the California Public Utilities Commission and it was rejected. A lot, it was a huge fight over it. Um, the utilities came out swinging against it. <laughs> so that didn't happen. So th that kind of sharing that you're describing is really, it, it depends on where you are and, and, and the circumstances of the utility. There's an interesting, in Brooklyn, there's an interesting um, microgrid, the Brooklyn microgrid, where they're, they're testing out the technical aspects of doing that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think it's called transactional energy is what they're looking at. So um, it's happening, but it's kind of nation. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one, there's Frank, I don't know if his last name is Reno or he's from Reno. Uh, the question is, how can a microgrid achieve 24-7 dependability without connecting to a macrogrid that provides power from baseload generators? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, it can. Um, it's probably at this point in time going to have some fossil fuel within the microgrid. 
So we, we see a lot of microgrids um, for large facilities that will include a combined heat and power plant, and it's probably going to be gas fired or, um, or biogas fired, more, more likely natural gas fired. Um, and so that, that kind of microgrid can guarantee the, the 24 seven, um, because it's, it, it, if, when the sun's not shining, when the battery is depleted, they can rely on the fossil fuels. Um, these microgrids also tend to have, um, like I said, uh, they'll have diesel generators for, for the backup to the backup. So again, if the, if the battery is depleted, then the generators will kick on. It's interesting because we're starting to see it, for a long time, it, I would always say, you know, if, if you're building a microgrid in, in the United States, it's more than likely going to be grid connected. It's just these really far flung places, islands and mountains, towns that wouldn't have a grid connected microgrid. That's starting to change. And this is a really fascinating trend. We're seeing in California some pretty big operations, agricultural operations, wineries. Um, there was actually a, a big hotel in New York City, in New York City, that decided to not be on the grid. And in New York, um, the grid operator said, I mean, excuse me, the, the hotel operator said that um, it was just too expensive to stay on the grid. And he had a combined heat and power microgrid developed for his um, facility. In California, people are developing microgrids off grid um, for similar reasons. Some of them say it's just less expensive. But they're also so frustrated with the delays and in interconnection that they're saying better to just build the microgrid and see how it goes without the grid connection. And maybe eventually we'll connect to the grid, but you know, we don't really think we have to. So um, to answer the question, there, there are ways, again, more than likely you're going to have some kind of fossil fuel associated with the microgrid um, to, to be completely islanded all the time. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next one's from David Klein. I have seen modeling from vibrant clean energy that looks closely at microgrid opportunities across the whole US in a national model. Their scenario that integrates microgrids actually builds more transmission than a green grid technology that does not optimize microgrids into the system. That strongly suggests to me that new transmission is still important and valuable, even when we get good at implementing microgrids. Can you comment on that? Sure. I have not seen that study. I would love to. It sounds really very interesting. Um, this concept of a grid of microgrids is still really, really new and has not been figured out yet. Um, there's the beginnings of it are happening in a few places. Chicago is one place with the Bronzeville microgrid, where they have connected um, a, a community with uh, a college. And the, the two are two microgrids that work together. And the concept is that it's more efficient and more reliable to have two microgrids because, <clears throat> you know, obviously if, if, the, if something's not happening in one microgrid, the other can take over and they can share efficiencies. Um, but it, it's so new, and I would be really hesitant to, to say that we would need more transmission because we don't really even know yet how that's all going to work. If we actually ever do have a grid of microgrids, um, the technology is just too new to know how it will work. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, next uh, from uh, is what are the most important enabling processes, policies, what are the most important enabling policies at the state level to encourage microgrid development? Or what are the most powerful microgrid enabling policies in other states? Ah, that's a really good question, huh? So first of all, I think um, grant programs are really helpful, um, especially for communities because um, they just don't have the, the capital a lot of times to get these things going. So grant programs, we see a lot of those in California. Another thing we're starting to see in a few states is development of microgrid tariffs. That's helpful. But I'm gonna go back again to interconnection because that seems to be what I hear about the most from people that, you know, although microgrids don't have the kind of delays that transmission does because smaller projects we know get through the, the transmission queue quicker, they still, they're still in that long queue and something's gotta be done about that. that that's gotta be worked out. Um, the other thing I hear more about lately, too, is people are asking for um, 
market rules that are consistent across um, RTOs and ISOs because um, again, microgrids can can play in those markets and they can provide grid services, but it's difficult because they're different from place to place. So if you're a national microgrid developer, you're dealing with a hodgepodge of rules and trying to figure out you know, how you're going to make this work. So more consistency of rules, I think, is extremely important too. And here's a related question. Could you speak more about what policies can be enacted to allow the development of microgrids and get around any over the fence constraints established by the incumbent utility. How have other states gotten around this? Well, they've not, that's the problem. I think every state has this problem. Um, so I think we have to really look at those old utility rules. I mean, they were made for another time when microgrids weren't even conceived. Um, it's difficult because as you all know, utilities are very powerful before state regulators, they have a strong voice and um, they don't want to give up these old um, advantages that they have. But um, so again, I think it goes back to really educating policymakers so they can understand um, why this is a problem. You know, you look at these PUCs and the energy offices and states and they are just so inundated with information and people coming at them. So we really need to, to be at the table and talking to them more. <clears throat> Thank you. A uh, question from Bob Hopper. Uh, couldn't solar panels be put on every elementary school to create a system of microgrids? There's an elementary school in most every American neighborhood or community. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, they could. Um, <laughs> so we are seeing more schools starting to put on, um, colleges were one of the first, but, but you know, K through 12, not so much, but that's starting to change. There's, there's several in California, several schools that have done that. And it's great because not only you know, does it cut their costs and, and give them reliability, something they're all really worried about now that they're, they're starting to adopt electric school buses. You do not wanna deal with a power outage when you have a fleet of electric school buses. Mm -hmm. Um, so they are they are starting to put in microgrids, and I, I I agree with you. I think that we could definitely use schools more. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Claudia Engelhoff asked, maybe I missed this, but is there a comprehensive inventory of microgrids in the U.S. that is accessible? No, that's yeah. There's not. <laughs> I okay. wish there were. Um, okay. So there is the DOE map I showed you. That's not comprehensive. There are private groups or private organizations like with McKenzie and Guidehouse that do research um, you know, every couple of years and, and try to gauge how many microgrids are out there, but the reports are expensive. They're not easily accessible, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, and Julie Zanheiser asked if you could share any information from your interview with Robert Bennett of Block Energy, uh, who apparently discovered a way to work collaboratively with utilities. Yes. Um, yeah, I love that interview. What they're doing is so interesting. Uh, Black Energy, which um, is a subsidiary of Amira Technologies, and I, they, they're the, I mentioned them earlier, the Tampa Electric Microgrid, that's the one they developed. Um, so he's from a utility background and he's retired. And so he's trying to basically, he was trying to figure out a way to get utilities on board. And he developed a business model which benefits both the utility and the community. Um, so what he does is, um, his company does is they develop um, residential microgrids <clears throat> and um, they're grid connected and um, they are, they're, so a lot of microgrids, it's not a lot, but a certain number of microgrids um, sort of put down their stakes and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna build a microgrid here. The developers will do that. And then the utilities might sort of, you know, bristle at it. Well, he's he's instead going to the utilities first and saying, hey, let's build this together. And um, so um, he's got some successful projects as a result. That's great. Uh, from Tom, we asked, what sort of coordination has happened or could happen at the national level to plan microgrids and what goals should be addressed? So um, <laughs> um, that's a very good question, too. We've seen a lot of progress lately. Um, the DOE is definitely looking closely at microgrids. And of course, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, we were thrilled to see how much microgrids were brought into play um, there, particularly with that 
um, 30% tax credit that I mentioned. Um, so uh, I think you know, the, the best way, again, is, is, is probably in that case is to, is to talk to your congressman. Again, they don't necessarily understand what a microgrid is. So when things come up for a vote, um, it, it, it may just get passed by. Um, so things are getting better, but they're not quite there yet in terms of the national scene. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Hamilton asks, if the existing national grid has passed the end of life by 20 years, doesn't it need to be replaced or upgraded? How would that work in conjunction with microgrids? Yeah, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's both. Um, we're not going to just, you know, shut down the national grid. It definitely has a lot of value. Um, so, yes, it does need to be upgraded. Um, and microgrids can actually be part of that upgrade. There are places where you can build a microgrid instead of do, building a, a substation. Uh, if, if you can look at, you know, the, the cost, ben you can do a cost benefit analysis and determine which is better. Some utilities have been required to do this. Um, in New York, for example, um, and I think in Connecticut too, they require, they require utilities as part of their um, integrated resource planning, whatever they happen to call it in those states, um, to look at uh, where a non wires alternative would be a better bet than upgrading or building something new. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, it's a matter of considering it. I mean, the problem is that it's not always being considered. We're just sort of going to the old approach and saying, let's just upgrade the transmission. Let's just build new transmission. And we're not saying, okay, is there an alternative? And, and is it more cost effective? And will it provide more resilience? So yeah, I think uh, that's what we need to do. Great, thanks. Uh, Joe Britton asks, if we got past all the policy issues, public and corporate, what do you know about how much of a technical hurdle there might be in developing the local controllers to balance local generation and demands, as well as the interface to the grid? Not a lot. These are great questions, by the way. What a great group. I'm really, really impressed. Um, yeah, not a lot of technical challenges from what I understand. I mean, people are doing this. Arizona Public Service has been, has been doing this for a while. Um, so I, I think they're not, I think that, what I hear over and over and over again from people who are developing microgrids is we, we've got the technology, that's not the problem. The problem really is the policies. Great. Uh, Leslie Glester asks, how can a microgrid be built in an existing neighborhood and would it use the existing distribution system or have its own? Can it be done if the utility is not cooperative? Probably not. Um, and what I've seen of these neighborhood microgrids, typically they have their own distribution within the neighborhood, but then they connect to the utility system um, outside of the neighborhood because they want to have a um, they, they want to have that connection because there's a lot of value to having that grid connection. Um, like I said before, there there's a lot of um, there's monetary value because the, the microgrid actually, becomes a financial asset if you're connected to the grid because you can sell services to the grid. Mm. So um, I think I answered your question. So yeah, typically in the neighborhood, it's, it's, it owns the distribution and then outside it's connected to the grid. Okay. Brian Highland asks, uh, a recent sponsored microgrid knowledge email was sent titled, Six Reasons Why Natural Gas Should Remain a Go-To Solution. With the, with the deceptive statement, natural gas is significantly cleaner than fossil fuels. What is your view of fossil fuels and microgrids? Um, I don't know how, did we actually say that natural gas is significantly cleaner than fossil fuels? I'll have to take a look at that because it is a fossil fuel, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so this is an interesting debate that we often have at conferences about microgrids. Pretty much everybody would love microgrids to be all renewable. However, at this point in time, um, if you want 100% reliability, you're not gonna be able to have a 100% renewable microgrid. Um, the example that often is used is a hospital. You know, Would you want a hospital to be 100% renewable energy? Would you dare to do that? You wouldn't, you would have backup generation, that's diesel. Now. The thing that's, or, or maybe natural gas, diesel or natural gas, but um, 
But the thing that's important to remember that is you're going to be using those fossil fuels a lot less often if you're using a solar storage microgrid than you are if you're simply connected more than likely to the grid, depending on where you are and what your utility is using. But for the most part, you know, most utilities are not using that much solar that it would, um, that the microgrid would not be cleaner. Thank you. We have several other great questions and uh, I'm seeing we're close to time and we do call this an empower hour. So um, a couple of things. One is I'm going to just uh, turn it back to Mary for some closing re remarks and we'll, uh, Alisa, would you be willing to stay on for a few moments after our official close? To, that would be wonderful. Be happy to. Yes. That would be wonderful. And then just as a, before I hand it to Mary, the Professor K.K. Duvivier uh, is a, a law professor here, and she just wants to notice, uh, let people know that she has an article coming out in the Stanford Technology Law Review in June that addresses the history and the need to change the laws for microgrids. It's called Mo Mobilizing Microgrids, and uh, we can contact her for more information and we'll make sure you get that information and we can also when the article comes out if it's publicly available we could put the link to that on our website so thank you once again and mary over to you great thanks chris uh and thank you so much elisa for your time and sharing your expertise i know you're going to answer some more questions but in the meantime uh, I also want to thank the other Empower Our Future communication team members who are integral to making these Empower Hours happen, and that would be Paul Cullinan, who is often behind the scenes, uh, Chris Hoffman, and Steve Whitaker. Uh, they're great folks to work with on this wonderful uh, project we do on a regular basis. Um, so again, we're hoping we will have a May event, but do save Tuesday, June 13th uh, for a passive house presentation by uh, Fort Collins architect Greg Fisher. Um, and again, just one more reminder that this video of this talk tonight will be on the Empower Our Future website on the events page, along with all the other uh, past Empower Hours. And uh, again, just officially, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. But if you can stay on, please do, uh, as the Q&A will continue. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Lisa, it looks like we've got um, maybe four or so more questions. Uh, the next one is from Moore Wolfson. He says, a big part of your theme is that somehow microgrids should be viewed as a sizable alternative to the expansion of transmission. Maybe, but have you conflated the microgrid topic by minimizing the value of transmission? My trusted sources over the years have agreed that what we need is a pedal to the metal on both transmission and distributed energy resources. Your response? Great question. That's a great question. So yes, I do think we need to um, upgrade the transmission system. There's no doubt about that. As I said before, we're not going to do away with transmission. Um, but my point is that we're not looking at microgrids as an alternative. We're simply going to the old school approach. You, very rarely do you see just a few places I know that are actually looking at non-wires alternatives. So the, the balance is off. We're, we There's no doubt we need to do both, but we are really not looking very closely at microgrids as a society, as, as an alternative. We're not looking, we need to we need to check them out. Like I said, there's we need to do cost benefit analysis and see when I'm gonna build this new, new line or this new substation, is it better to do a microgrid or distributed energy or is it better to do this line? And there are places, like I said, New York could do that, but not everybody's doing it. Great, thank you. Uh, Julie Zanheiser asks, are the utility rules controlled at the state level or could FERC weigh in on this? Well, yeah, so transmission is, is um, governed at the federal level and that's FERC and distribution is governed at the uh, local level and that's PUC. So typically microgrids, if there's gonna be any kind of um, 
regulatory action is going to be at the PUC, the state level, not, not at the federal or FERC level. Because microgrids are, you know, at the, at the distribution level. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a question, I guess Frank actually is in Reno. Uh, I'm not, let me read it. I'm not quite clear about this. Not so much a question, but a comment. We had a terrible winter here in Reno, 70 feet of snow at Donner Pass and nearly 24 seven reliability was absolutely a life and death issue and was achieved. So, so I don't know. If, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know year. if Reno was on a microgrid or, or not, maybe you know. Either. Okay. And again, the, the comment from KK Duvivier, and we will make sure that you get her contact information. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And that's what we have in the oh, QA. One more question. Sorry, I don't think I can put a question in the QA yeah. as a panelist. Uh, but I am curious, Elisa. Uh, you're obviously a journalist at the core, but how did you end up focusing on microgrids? Yeah, so I've been writing about energy for about 30 or more years now. And um, during Superstorm Sandy, I was here in Virginia and some of the publications I wrote for, which were um, the S&P Platts publications and Renewable Energy World were in New England and New York. Um, and they were uh, really having trouble, you know, getting, getting, getting any reporting done, obviously, because of Superstorm Sandy. Um, it wish it, you know, if you remember that just totally wiped out the, the Northeast. Um, anyway, so they were asking, I was sitting at my desk at 6 a.m. and like getting up at 10 o'clock that night because I was just reporting constantly. And I was doing a lot of reporting on what was happening in New York. And I was listening to all of the governor's um, uh, press conferences. And at one point he said, um, we've got to do something. I and mean, this, after this is all over, this doesn't make sense the way we're doing electricity. This doesn't make sense, you know. That, and, um, and I started thinking, well, what are they going to do? Are they going to do combined heat, more combined heat and power? What are they going to do? And then the word microgrid just started sort of popping up more and more as, as I was interviewing people. And um, I, was, I had my own publication called Energy Efficiency Markets at that time. And so I started writing about microgrids in there. And we, we always follow the traffic really carefully of what people are um, reading. And we noticed that every time we wrote a microgrid story, the traffic just like exploded on the site. And so I, I realized people were clearly interested. So I just started talking to more and more people about it. And, and, and I was just getting a lot of nods that, yeah, this is really something that we need to do. And that's how I got started. <laughs> Neat. That's great. So Superstorm Sandy was was the reason. Really. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a terrible reason. But uh, in, in fact, were there some places on the East Coast that had microgrids in place that were not as impacted? Yeah, that was one thing that was very interesting during that time is, is um, Princeton University, for example, has a very sophisticated microgrid. And there were some hospitals in New York City. <laughs> Excuse me. And... Uh, People were asking why are they, in fact, the press conferences, people were saying, why are the lights on in some of these places? Um, you know, and it was because they had microgrids, they had some of the, the earlier microgrids. And now that microgrids actually have been around like since Edison, he was doing mm -hmm. microgrids, but mm -hmm. what we call microgrids today is this kind of more advanced microgrid. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Elisa, uh, thank you again. And uh, we've seen several uh, thanks and words of appreciation in the Q&A. And then there was one, if you have time for one more, there's one just came in, if you have a minute. Sure. Okay. Uh, it's from Leslie Glustrom. We have an area in South Central Colorado called the San Luis Valley. It is transmission constrained, and there is discussion of building another transmission line into the valley, but it isn't easy because there aren't many passes that can be used. Much of the valley is rural with farmers and ranchers widely dispersed, think five miles apart. Can you comment? Well, um, it sounds like it, it's not an easy answer, um, but I would suggest, and I often suggest this to communities, is to get in touch with a microgrid developer. Um, you don't have to necessarily use that microgrid developer or, or develop a microgrid at all, but they can give you a pretty quick assessment of whether or not it's going to be technically possible or not. So I would I would suggest you do that. Great. Thank you very much.
Okay, those are all the questions we've got. And um, I just want to thank you again. And if for the 30 or something people still on, please watch for the recording of this. And uh, please visit the website for microgrid knowledge. And thank you once again, Lisa. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Okay. Good night. Good night.